Hello, Father Murr. Robert, good afternoon. Father Murr, I'd like to defer to your wisdom and your profound knowledge and ask you to take over the program and ask me questions. Well, if you're going to do that, it's going to be a very short program, Robert. <laughs> my, my profound knowledge. Sure, I want to find out all, all, all about what you're seeing, what you're witnessing, uh, experiencing, the people you've talked to at the uh, at the this, the uh, synod. Uh, all right. Can you tell us just generally uh, the spirit there and uh, what you've been able to uh, to perceive? Okay. Uh, thank you for asking. The Synod is a kind of love fest. It is a, a repeat. The, the, the talking points are always that people have heard from the ends of the earth the voices of people who are part of the Catholic Church and that this has been very enlightening and has deepened people's understanding of the global church. And each person at the press conferences, we have daily press briefings. Once or twice, they skip a day. Uh, but we have several bishops and cardinals and lay people, five or six people at each of the briefings. They speak for five minutes each, and then they're responding to questions. Probably uh, today, it was interesting uh, because uh, Robert Prevost, Cardinal Prevost, who is now choosing, he's the prefect of the Dicastery for Bishops. He's American, but he spent a number of years in Peru. He spoke today both in English and Spanish. And so, uh, in, in other words, in other words, he's he's uh, he's he's uh, filling uh, Bajo's place. That's the place that Bajo had, right? That's exactly right. He right. he sees the dossiers come in. And uh, he has a big input. Of course, he has counselors, advisors. They have whole teams set up from each country, from each part of the church to propose priests who may be Episcopal candidates. But he's the one who actually is in charge of it all. So he's a key figure under Pope Francis, under this present pontificate and for the coming five years, usually each Vatican term is for five years and often renewed. And uh, that's a very important post. It was held up till now by Cardinal Ouellette, but Robert Prevost has- well, Robert, let me, let me ask now that you've had some contact with him, what impression uh, does he did he make on you? Well, I think he's a man who was deeply impacted by being in parishes and in a diocese in Peru, and he is a man deeply influenced by this uh, mutual exchange that occurs in the Western Hemisphere between the Anglo-speaking, English-speaking American society in which the Catholic Church in America and in Canada live, and uh, the Latin Americans, the Peruvians. And uh, now he's in Rome, and he's trying to find uh, bishops for every part of the world. So he's a Western Hemisphere figure, I think, who is now becoming uh, Romanized. And uh, he seemed very thoughtful, quiet, discreet, and hopeful, and Good. not not a man uh, take not a man who would take uh, adventuresome uh, decisions, a man who would try to support the church with people who are competent, capable. I, I had a good impression of him. Good. And you were telling me that you were telling me that uh, that uh, uh, when uh, our Cardinal uh, Cardinal Seurat, what were you saying about Cardinal Seurat and a new book coming out? Very. This evening, in about 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. hasn't happened yet. Okay. Yeah. As soon as we get off this program, I'm going to uh, hop in a cab, I think, from the Janiculum Hill, where you used to live. That's right. And, and I'm going to go down to the Palazzo Cesi on the Via della Conciliazione, which, in fact, I, th I think is unreachable by car now because they blocked the entire street. 
It's almost a pedestrian zone now. And uh, you never saw it, I think, in, in that. No, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. I, 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 the traffic there used to be, actually, there, there was a good reason for having churches on almost every street corner in Rome. One church, you could ask for the favor of crossing the street without being killed. And on the other side, you could give thanks to God for not having been killed, crossing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, the tra Roman traffic was crazy. And the Via della Conciliazione was impossible to cross at times. Yeah. Yeah. So, good. It's, it's, it's good. So, so Cardinal Seurat, I had an, a nice meeting with him uh, two or three days ago in his apartment where he, he lives just outside the Porta Sant'Anna in the Citta Leonina Piazza there. Also right. in that same building, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger used to live right. before he became Pope for many years. And uh, Cardinal Muller has been living there for many years. He was uh, Ratzinger's uh, later successor in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, right. Gerhard Muller. And he's also working on the opera Omnia of Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger. And he still lives in that apartment building. And then on the other side, the other staircase, Cardinal Sarah, who is from Guinea and who doesn't have a role in Rome, a particular role. Uh, he's writing another book. He's preparing to uh, give another uh, thoughtful reflection on the faith, on Jesus Christ in the next few months. And it should be out in the spring, I think. And he's coming and, to and, and, and what have you what have you heard from the from the meetings of, uh, of the Synod? Well, what I've heard is essentially summed up yesterday, and I wrote something about the speech given by Father. Timothy Radcliffe. He's British. He was the head of the Dominican order. He's mm -hmm. taught in Oxford. He's been at Blackfriars in Oxford as a, as a priest at that church. He's uh, extremely intelligent. He's very witty. He was chosen by Pope Francis to be the homilist in the three-day retreat to open this synod. And as a Dominican, in, in a sense, he's, he's, he's an heir to the great Dominican theologian, Thomas Aquinas, who lived in the 1200s. But uh, Timothy Radcliffe gave a talk to the Synod, I think it was yesterday morning, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, no, it was Monday morning, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, I called this article Germination. I put it on my, I sent it out as a letter, which I send for free to anyone who subscribes. And uh, Timothy is now, 78, and he said this, uh, he, he said, these at the bottom of this page here, these 11 months, that means from now until next October, will be like a pregnancy. Do you see how, how suggestive are the words of this Dominican? Abraham and Sarah are promised they will have descendants more numerous than the sand on the seashore but nothing appears to happen. Sarah laughs when she hears this promise the third or fourth time as she listens hidden in the tent to the strangers in Genesis 18, probably a bittersweet laugh. She has heard it all before and she remains barren, but in a year's time, she will bring, she will bear a child of laughter. So what he's saying is uh, what I write below the essence of the matter is that the upcoming 11 months, the upcoming 11 months will be like the period of gestation of a pregnancy. And this synod right now will come to a conclusion without a specific change. I'll read the sentence that's highlighted in blue. This is the clue that there is no result to be expected from this present synod except one that the church during this synod has become, quote, pregnant, unquote, with the, quote, seed, unquote, that will be, quote, born, unquote, next October, in the fall of 2024, into a new, quote, synodal, unquote, church, a church which will be the, quote, fruit, unquote, of the synodal process, which has been underway for two years now and still has 11 months of, quote, gestation, unquote, remaining. This is what Radcliffe reveals to us 
in his important October 23rd talk. So I would say everyone's been wondering if they will decide something about any blessings of same-sex couples or any uh, expansion of the role of women as deacons. Well, excuse me, for right there, Robert. Didn't didn't uh, Francis already say that that uh, that that decision was left up to each individual Catholic priest? No, I mean I I don't know that no? that's the case. I think uh, oh, I thought I thought he had I thought he had made that remark. I'm sorry. Well, I could have to go back and check that. He may, in fact, because he does say things in so many venues and so many different occasions and so many different interviews that he may actually have said that too. Yeah, I've but, noticed that about him, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose that's the number one complaint that people have. And if we want to wrestle with his papacy, with his being Peter, with his confirming the faith of his brother bishops, we have to wrestle with this question. Uh, it's his method, I suppose to be in a sense, all things to all men, to say one thing on one occasion and one thing on another, to what extent this undermines or confuses the faithful. This in a sense, made him some time, perhaps in a way that we don't fully understand because of enormous pressures being placed on the Vatican, which none of us really knows except we can see it happening with the great reset coming and the um, the globalist agenda to somehow bring about a new world order and to have the Ch Catholic Church come along in that order. This is undoubtedly the place we find ourselves in right now, in October of 2023. But we, as, be, as part of, you know, people living in this time, don't have the advantage of the next 10 or 50 or 100 years to understand everything that's happening and what the deep reasons for why these things are happening. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I just I, I have I've, I've had trouble over the years uh, trying to uh, to keep up with uh, with what Francis is saying, because he does have that tendency to say one thing one moment and another thing, another moment, and it sort of depends on who he's talking to. Uh, I, I, I saw that a lot in, uh, in civil politics, but I've never, never really seen it that, that, uh, that presented, that present in the, in the, in the church. Uh, the, the, uh, so they're not deciding anything. So this is all, you, you use the, the word uh, love, like a love fest. What is this, the Woodstock of, of, of 2023 Catholic style or what? I mean, I literally am astonished by the fact that this seems seamlessly in control. I've never seen anything under such control in my life, really. Well, now, just a minute. Just a minute. Stop there and, and let's be clear about this. In control or under control? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. Uh, people seem to be of goodwill. At the same time, the same phrases keep coming out over and over again, as if there's a kind of mind meld, as if yeah. everyone's heard a few sort of talking points and is sticking to them. They're doing it voluntarily. And uh, they, they deny that there is any tension. They're saying, we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit over and over. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing, but it, it makes me uneasy in some way. As if uh, what really in the predicament we find ourselves with in many countries, thousands and millions of people leaving the church no longer... Yes. How can this synod be going along in such a joyful way of feeling the Spirit is speaking to us? Doesn't the Spirit challenge us further to say, let's roll up our sleeves and change everything because we're heading yes. into the rocks? Well, the, uh, that you know, I've got to tell you, Robert, the, the use of the word spirit right from the beginning of this and even before this uh, by Rome is rather ambiguous because I, they, in most cases, they don't dare to call it the Holy Spirit. They just refer to the Spirit. Uh, 
there are a lot of different spirits. There's, uh, alcohol used to be called spirits too. Uh, you know, it's there's a spirit of joy, a spirit of, of fraternity, what have you. But uh, that shouldn't really be uh, confounded with with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing is one thing and another is another. There could also be a, a, a feelings or, or a spirit of fraternity, of cooperation, collaboration. But th that's not necessarily the, the, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. That's all I'm saying. Uh, you can have that in any any sort of a meeting. I've been in business meetings, invited by businessmen for 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 different reasons during the over the years, and there was a great uh, feeling of of a, a spirit of fraternity in those also. And I don't think the Holy Ghost had anything to do with those business decisions. I'm just I, I'm just uh, a little bit uh, wary of the of the uh, of 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 sort of insinuating that this is being run by the by the holy spirit and at the same time not not bold enough to say so well know, maybe i'm wrong maybe I'm wrong. um i think uh, we may want to comment just for a moment on this question which is a central one about the holiness sacramental sure. nature of marriage which represents the relationship of christ mm -hmm. and the church a central aspect of christian teaching for two thousand years and the fact is this, as well as other questions, are on the agenda, and it is for this reason that the Spirit and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is needed to guide us to remain faithful. What I have come to conclude is that we are in a tug of war with the world. The world uh, would like the church to change some of its teachings. Some of us are tempted as we're very human and weak and we're very kind hearted and would like to go along but at the same time uh, we want to remain absolutely faithful to our tradition and right here in this synod we're struggling with this and they are admitting themselves as they come out and say the holy spirit is making us uh, achieve a type of harmony they're referring to this tension between remaining absolutely faithful to the tradition Many people, I'm sure, have repeated that in the Synod. We've been told that. We've been told even that Cardinal Paraline made an intervention. That was written in an article by J.D. Flynn in The Pillar a few days ago, and I commented on that in one of my own letters. Hmm. Has said, we've got to remain faithful. We've got to remain faithful to the apostolic deposit of the faith. At the same time, the entire process is evidently too allow the ventilation of certain hopes and hurts, as people have said, they use the word hurt several times, so that uh, there could be a development, is what they're calling it, of our church doctrine in such a way as to reach out and be more inclusive and more accepting of other people. Uh, I would call it a double helix. Let's put it this way. Just as the human being has in our physical bodies, a genetic code, a DNA, that gives us our identity, a very complicated molecular form. There are double helix, we are told, a complicated grouping of cells. So too, the church has a genetic code, which has these two strands in it. One is absolute fidelity to the apostolic deposit of the faith, we remain faithful to what Jesus taught and the apostles handed down. At the same time, we are told to go to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel to all nations and to find a way to do that as effectively as possible. And that second strand seems to be the one they're trying to favor now, and it's being debated. To what extent can they develop or possibly revise in some way the teaching in some matters so that we can be more accepted and more inclusive of certain difficult situations. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to make a, a suggestion to anyone who has any input in the synod uh, on synodality, and that would be to really take note of all of the, of the, uh, the action of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit acts and when the Holy Spirit doesn't act, 
how he acts and what have you. I'm serious about that. If, 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 if you're claiming that the Holy Spirit is present in all of these things, I really think that it should be documented so that we can later on study the actual workings of the Holy Spirit. That's marvelous. That would be a marvelous contribution uh, hmm. to, the, to, to theology. Uh, yeah, also, Father also here, here's a great suggestion, Father Murr. Oh, but I'm serious. I'm serious. I mean, if somebody if somebody could do that, say uh, this was said, and that's not by the Holy Ghost, and this was said, and it is by the that okay. would be great. So that we could we could really come to an understanding of uh, all right. So, so there'll be a press works. there'll be a press briefing tomorrow. I will write that question down and prepare to ask it. If uh, usually fifteen or twenty journalists raise their hands, I'll raise my hand. See if yes. I can ask. Where have to, there to, been to, if they could document if they could be documenting along with this what they are certain of uh, as being the actions of the Holy Spirit and and what is not I think that that would be that would be very very good later on for a for a form critic uh, critical or form criticism of the of the of the entire uh, the entire meetings and also it would be a great contribution to the to the working of the Holy Spirit how the Holy Spirit works. Well, Father uh, Mer you're, you're being yes. provocative. You're being provocative, I think. But isn't this the essence of what we call discernment? Oh, excuse me. I'm not being pr pr provocative. And maybe the maybe the question is, I'm serious about it. If if you have a group of people under the under the the uh, the, the the bishop of Rome who have, have come together for for such a serious purpose, and they're following the Holy Spirit, and they they actually can tell you. This is of the Holy Spirit, and this is not. It should be documented. All of those things. I mean, I'm serious about that. It should be documented because I think it would. I know it would add tremendously to the uh, to the understanding of the of, of the working of the Spirit that we've not. We certainly have not just begun to scratch the surface in two thousand years. This would be a great contribution to understanding how it works and under what circumstances. I'm serious about that. Yeah, I mean. Uh, one thing is that since the Second Vatican Council, and including these bishops' meetings, but this one perhaps most of all, there has been a tendency to avoid a phrase which was used in all of the early councils of the church, and that phrase is anathema sit. Anathema, anathema sit means may it be anathema, and anathema means uh forbidden, uh, excluded. Or uh, condemned, right? Okay, yeah. And that well, would be so in, other, so in other words, in other words, nothing that's coming out of this seems to be condemned or, or they're, I'm cert they're certainly not in the business of condemning. I understand that. So well, what, nothing that's going to come out of this is, is condemnable? Well, let's say this. It's a puzzle to me how 20 centuries of councils can conclude that something is a danger for the faith and they say this is condemned if we would do this or say this or believe this it would not be in keeping with the purity of our apostolic faith but in these last 60 years nothing has been condemned and nothing is even it in fact the only thing that is condemnable is to condemn that seems a change to me. <laughs> Remarkable. That, but you're right. You're right. The only thing that that, that is that is condemnable is is to condemn. You're right. That 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 of course that of course began with the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the, that the the anathema was never used. Uh, I don't believe it was used once in the council. No. It was called for by by certain members of the council, fathers of the council, but. Uh, that wasn't the spirit of it, and I understand that they were. It was a pastoral council, as this is sort of a pastoral research uh, committee, if you will. It's pastoral more than doctrinal. I understand that also, but it's not. It's not completely free of doctrine. It's a, you can't just you can't put the doctrine off to one side and say we're just pastoral and we're looking at this that, and the other thing. They have to be. Everything has to be taken into account, right? Yes. I I had one experience I wanted to share uh, yesterday's press conference. I hope I'm not giving the wrong day. Uh, Cardinal Schoenborn, I think these press conferences are on the internet. People can actually look for them and, and, and view them. But Cardinal Schoenborn, 
who was the chief author of the catechism back in 1990, mm-hmm. 91, 92. It was published in 1992. Yes. He was assisted, of course, by Joseph Ratzinger, and it was under John Paul II. But he was the Dominican, and again, the Dominicans include the illustrious Dr. Angelicus Thomas Aquinas. And uh, he's now much older. And he said, actually, he said to me, he says, I'm getting very old. He's in his late uh, 70s now. And uh, it happens. I, it happens. Yes. And, but uh, he was being asked whether there wasn't a departure from doctrine with regard to these questions of blessing same-sex couples. And um, two journalists, Edward Penton and Diane Montagna, went up at the end of the press conference and I walked up behind and listened in as they asked Cardinal Schoenborn whether or not he was departing from the Orthodox tradition, the author of the catechism in his suggestion that there should be some evaluation of this question, that the church should be open to it in some way. And they were saying it can't be, it should not be. Almost they were saying anathema sit, it must not be, it must be forbidden. And he looked at uh, Diane Montagna who had studied under him at an institute in Austria, which is very Mm. famous for producing thoughtful Catholic thinkers. And he was the grand chancellor of that institute. And he said, Diane, I'm sorry that you have become so narrow and you were a graduate of that institute. And she said, Cardinal, I'm sorry that you have become so open to uh, confusion and perhaps uh, error in Catholic teaching. And Mm -hmm. that perhaps was the most striking moment so far of my coverage of the Synod, and this is the first time I've mentioned it, and I think the first time anyone has mentioned it. But the the student and the teacher, the two views and the two opinions about each other's views sort of summarize that tension, which has not been expressed in any way in the official uh, coverage of this Synod. Right, right, right. Well, right. But this is this is the conflict right from the beginning, Robert, that everyone was seeing right from the beginning. They're seeing right now, and I think they're going to continue seeing. There seems to be a direct conflict between uh, the teaching of the church, which cannot change, and items that they that that, that the uh, the people who are participating in the synod and the bishop of Rome, the present one want changed. Uh, I, I'm very interested to, to see what they're going to come up with because uh, that's going to be a good one. That's going to be a good one. You've got two really opposite, uh, not opinions, uh, schools, yeah. and uh, they, they're trying to come up with that with something that's going to, going to please everyone. I don't know how okay. that's going to be possible, but it, it it's going to be it's- it's going to be difficult, I think. But here's the press conference today. It looks the same every day that people change. That's Diane Montagna in the, just in the back. Here's uh, Cardinal Prevost. If we could go back just to, just there where we just were. Uh, yeah, there's up on the upper left is the assistant press secretary for the Vatican. The man sitting down next to her is the chief uh, press spokesman. And uh, that's Cardinal Prevost in the middle, and there's Archbishop Rolio next to the last right. I was just there an hour, an hour and a half ago. And uh, um, these are the briefings we receive. This is the insight that we receive into what's happening in the Synod. None of the documents have been published except, except one or two, like Timothy Radcliffe's remarks the other day. And uh, we really can't evaluate any of the dialogue. Nothing has been uh, uh, leaked out of anybody standing up and say, I disagree or, or I second that. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, we were told today at the press conference by Cardinal Prevost that in the first day, they were, everyone was told, do not speak to the press. We want to establish sufficient trust among the 450 people attending the synod that they can speak to each other and not fear 
that the person they are speaking to will go out and speak to the New York Times or anybody else. And did anyone, the, I'm just interested, Robert, did anyone ever bring up the fact to the same cardinals that during the last two or three conclaves, which are under papal secrecy, uh, uh, also the the goings on of those conclaves has been leaked by this by by cardinals to the press. No one's they, brought that. No. I don't know how they're going to do it for four hundred and fifty people to to, yeah. to keep a secret. That'll be. They got a lot of good things coming along. I'd like to see how it how it goes. It's good. It's yeah. going to be interesting. Well, I do think what I wanted to repeat is that the next eleven months are the true time when the church can work out whether it wants to go along with this spirit of the synod or it wants to take a stand in favor of a, of a truth of the faith. And I think our task as we do these podcasts, as we reflect on these matters, as we have maybe some other people come on, as I write some things, and I, I think our task is over the next 11 months. So I would say anyone watching, if they want to help us to do this, that we are, in a sense, the synod uh, observers and participants because we are part of the church. And even though we weren't attending these meetings inside the Vatican, we are uh, qualified to comment on whatever we learn. And as these next weeks go by and some people say what they experienced at the synod, I think... Uh, I think uh, we will be playing a critical role and perhaps decisive role. And I hope we have the ability to do so. Yeah, I've got to tell you, uh, I heard from a, a friend of mine, a, a, a priest, a, a theologian, who proposed something to me just as just a question. He said, perhaps we could learn something from the Jews at this point in our own evolution as church. And uh, I was very interesting to see what, what that was. He said, the Jews have actually organized themselves into three religious camps, Orthodox, conservative, and reformed. Hmm. And they're, they're, all, they're, they're all Jews. They, they, they consider themselves Jews. They are Jews. They follow different uh, three different paths in Judaism. He said, I wonder if we would ever get to such a thing, to such a point in the Catholic Church. I said, I didn't believe so because we have doctrine that if you do not believe, you cease to be Catholic. It's, I mean, it's quite, it's, it's, it's severe. It's not, uh, these, a lot of our doctrines are not up for grabs. Uh, it, they're not, they're not pious opinions. They are, they mm -hmm. are, they are demands that we believe uh, in faith. Uh, well, but, but, I thought, but I thought that was an I thought that was an interesting observation. He's looking I, I, already. For, they're already looking for for ways to 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 make everyone happy. I don't know if that's going to be the the the. Well, the I, I think effort. trying to I think trying to make everyone happy is a, rep, a recipe for making no one happy. Yeah, you think, you know that, and I know that, and anybody who's lived long enough and has had to deal with people knows that. I also well, saw something else happen, uh, Robert, many years as a priest when, when uh, especially when bishops or superiors wanted to get something pushed through a community of believers or priests in this case, uh, they would send out, I, 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 can, I can remember the instances perfectly well, uh, the bishops would send out uh, small groups of priests, for example, four or five priests who he had prepared, and they showed up with uh, easels and, you know, those big pads of paper and magic markers and everything else, and they were going to explain everything to us. And I remember, I remember this in one occasion. Uh, one of the priests who was presenting said, the bishop would like to know your concerns. Well, he we, we was talking to about 400 priests. He would like to know your concerns. And somebody somebody put up his hand, one of the priests said, our major concern is we, we don't feel we have a bishop. Oh. All right. And, and he was right. I mean, he was absolutely right. Everybody, uh, the vast majority agreed because we never saw him. We never heard from him everything else. 
Well, well you know, he couldn't he couldn't bring himself he couldn't bring himself around to writing that down on, on his chalkboard. <laughs> they, yeah. And well, he was, they were they were selective what they took. And I was watching this. I couldn't believe it. And I said to, to people, to other priests, when we, we would meet to, for coffee or something, I said, are you seeing the 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 uh, the, the the modus operandi here? Are you seeing the way it's being presenting presented and, and uh, how it's being led this way and led that way? Uh I sort of get the same feeling from this synod. I, I really do. I may be wrong at the, at the end. I hope I am, but I but I seem to think that it's uh, it was pre prepared, pre prepared, and I yeah. and I think people are being are being taken uh, down certain paths and avoiding other paths, and uh, I don't know if those other paths can be avoided and be and remain Catholic. This is these are very interesting times, and this is a very interesting study. Uh, yeah. And I hope I hope I mean, you realize it, and I realize it. This is going to be scrutinized thoroughly, thoroughly, and uh, a secret or no secret that people were were, were sworn to. This the 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 the, uh, the way things are being run and how they're presented uh, is going to get out and, and be seen. And this is what this is what Francis has asked right from the beginning. He wants transparency. He wants honesty. He wants uh, 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 he wants things to be uh, clear and honest and and uh, truthful. Well, this is this is what I think I'll, eventually this is going to get to, and I think that's going to be a great contribution for the church to see the truth of the whole matter. There you go. I was struck by your phrase where the church was lacking a bishop or the family is lacking a father. Mm -hmm. And I think there's been a great argument that we are a fatherless time, that uh, you as a father, I am as a father, maybe none of us has done what we truly as fathers should be doing. We, you know, we, uh, when I, when I, I studied uh, psychology under at NYU under, under Paul Witz, Dr. Paul Witz, brilliant man, he wrote a book that I would, uh, I would like to promote right here and now. It's called Faith of the Fatherless. Hmm. And he goes through psychology and psychiatry and brings out Sigmund Freud, for example, uh, this one, that one, Carl Rogers, uh, Erickson, and talks about their own relationships with their fathers and how those relationships were, were damaged and how it came out in their own work. It's a very, very good work that he did. Faith of the fatherless. Uh, I, I, I feel that what, from what I'm hearing from people, what I'm hearing from people, faith of the fatherless, psychology of atheism. There you go. What his point was, where there's, where there's a lack of, 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 of fatherly love and concern and direction, uh, this is also a, a reason for people not believing in God. Well, and he does. He makes a, he makes a very very good case. Brilliant man. I mean, anyway, I mean, the uh, I I think people people uh, I get hundreds of letters every week, hundreds from people all over the world, with in a state of confusion. Only only a couple of them were are, are, were really derogatory. Everyone is looking is is confused, and these are good Catholics who are writing, and good Christians. Some of them are are Protestants actually. Yeah. Looking for answers, uh, and one of the major thing is that that no answers are really coming coming through. They're not. Everyone is looking for answers, but there are no answers being given. And they're talking. Everyone is talking about a lack of authority, a lack of clarity, a lack of direction that exists in the in the Catholic Church these last uh, this last decade that never really existed so obviously before. This is a major well, concern. A major yeah, concern. What you're describing the absence of the father. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, like him or dislike him, you you have to follow the direction of the father, who, in his decisiveness, gives you that strength to face challenges and suffering. And Jesus referred to God as Abba, Father, and uh, the the when he asked. Uh, his, when he told his disciples how to pray, he said, "Our Father who art in heaven." We have uh, these may be some way deep psychological 
uh, characteristics of being a person, being a human, but we need to feel that the universe has a personal uh, dimension. I think the concept of a personal God and a personal father is essential. And uh, we've lost that. That's why that book was referring to atheism. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I would also add, when our Lord, when, when the Logos took flesh and became man, it was in the perfection of time that was the right time for the second person of the Blessed Trinity to become incarnate. That was the right time. And because Jesus Christ is true God and true man, he spoke in the perfect and clearest language that he could possibly speak in for that time and for all times. And when he called God Father, it wasn't an accident. We know that God is beyond anything that we can imagine. He is beyond anything we can imagine. But Christ came and told us what we essentially had to know about him, what, how we could deal with him, what we, could, what we could get our minds wrapped around. And paternity was exactly what he showed us. He never referred to God as mother, God as brother. You can find God in your brother. Yes, yes, but your brother is not God. But when he referred to God as father, and then he softened it, he softened it. You use the word Abba, which I, I, I so liked the times that I was in Lebanon and, and, uh, and Syria to be called uh, Abune, Abuna and Abune, right? Comes from, yeah. from Abba, from father. They, but, but that Abba is, is the, the closest thing that we have, it, have to it is Papa, Abba, Papa. It's dad. It's dad. Christ is saying when you when you speak to 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 God in prayer, call him your dad. Wow, can you imagine? This is this is what infuriated the Pharisees, infuriated the high priests, because they could not even pronounce the word for God. Couldn't even pronounce the word. Uh, you know, years ago when I was I was in New York, there was a, some some fools uh, vandalized a synagogue, in, I believe in Brooklyn. Terrible action by cowards. But one of them actually wrote the name of God, which is Yahweh. We can say it on the wall. Imagine this on the wall. Something. Yahweh, blasphemous. Hmm. The, the rabbis, and I know this from Rabbi Joe Weiss, who is a good friend of mine, he and, both he and his wife, uh, chiseled that out of the wall, the hmm. name of God, put it into a, a small coffin and buried it, took it for burial hmm. because it was that sacred. The name of God was that sacred. It cannot be pronounced by any Jew. They cannot mm -hmm. say that. They cannot say Yahweh, right? Now, imagine what respect, what respect is given the name of God. And our Lord comes along and calls him dad. <laughs> whoa, whoa. And this, this was, uh, people, this is lost in modern day language. It's lost. But the impact yeah. was was to the to the Orthodox Jews of, of, of his day, horrific, well, horrific. I, I'm I just saying. I'm just saying this. Christ insisted that God be understood as Father. He didn't change that. That's the way he presented him. God is much more than that. We understand that. But for our limited intelligence, that is enough to understand him. To understand what we can understand of him. It's put in language. Christ spoke that language so that we could understand. And where the father is lacking, Robert, where the father is lacking in homes and in families, children are damaged. Children are damaged. It's just, it's it's really, uh, hmm. it's really amazing. Father Murr, what's good to stop using blasphemy when, when, when I'm severe? Well, <laughs> no. What is a good way to stop using blasphemy when I'm when I'm severely angry? 
Uh, crackers and cheese. <laughs> that's that's what, you know what you do instead of instead of uh, I I think this is remarkable in English and and it's in most languages anyway the ones that I know. Uh, for example, when when the the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is taken taken is said, we as Catholics we always bow our head in reverence because we're told that at the mention of His name, angels in heaven. Genuflect. Can you imagine this? Fantastic. So a lot of people use his name in anger and in blasphemy. Well, you change it for something else. Jeepers creepers. <laughs> Where do you think that comes from? It's a nice way. Cheese and crackers is a nice way of saying of, of saying something else. Put something in its place. Don't just eliminate. Don't just eliminate. That's a good suggestion. Uh, eliminate swearing by putting something else in its in its stead. That's what you should do. I, I, I've given that advice to actually, I've given it to many people and I've taken it myself. So it works. Oh, okay. We have another question to ask, do you think the synod process will continue with the next pontificate or is there a chance the next Pope will shelf this stuff? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. Quick answer. There you go. Uh, next answer. Next question. No. But the next pope can certainly do as as he pleases. Uh, he can certainly say enough of this and and, and not shelf it. He can actually uh, dispose of it completely and say yeah. it's not to be considered at all. Uh, that depends on the next man. For the time being, this is what is, and I suggest we investigate it and go go along with it, see what what it what it results in and be open to it resulting positively and be open to it resulting negatively, okay? Be We're open ready for positive. everything. Yes. We're ready for everything. Father yes. Murph, Father yep. Murph, just back, back to the Lord's Prayer. We go on. Hallowed yes. be thy name. Thy, thy name be made holy or hallowed. Yes. hallowed. Uh, the holiness of God, the holiness of his church. I, I'm always moved when it says, and all his holy church or... Uh, because it's so evident that the, that our own sinfulness uh, impedes that, but somehow uh, Christ supplies. And this concept that holiness is real and that it provides life and it leads to eternal life and that it's the actual existence of God is almost forgotten now. Can you meditate on that for a moment? I, I sure can, and I can tell you why it's been forgotten, because it hasn't been taught. It's no longer taught. We, we've, we've failed uh, at, at least three generations of, of Christians and of Catholics in particular. Uh, they've been cheated out of their inheritance. They really have. The faith has not been, the faith has not been taught. And when you don't teach it, it's lost. Uh, this is why it is reviving all over the world in small groups. Uh, it's amazing prayer groups, groups of, of, of very, very good, pious people coming together to, to search for God, to search for him. He's there, and he gives us all of the indications of, of who he is and how he is. We have to study. We have to learn. We have to look. Seek, and you shall find, that kind of thing. Uh, the idea of holiness, Robert, let me just remind you I've got, a, I've got the, the afternoon sun coming right in and I can't move out of its way. I'm sorry, I look striped, but maybe no, that's no, an improvement. No. Who knows? Anyway, listen. It should be. The, it uh, should be. Holiness, holiness uh, the sacred, basically means not profane. That's what it basically means. It means being taken out of the world and reserved over here. It's, it's not... It doesn't belong to the world. It's a space that's reserved from the world, but it's not of the world. That's what holiness is. Uh, we, we say that objects are holy. They are holy because they're reserved. They're reserved for another use. You don't take a chalice, a beautiful chalice consecrated for holy mass and pour beer into it and drink. If you do your... Uh, uh, I don't know, like a reprobate. I mean, I, 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 I don't know who would do such a thing. But it's sacrilegious. sacrilegious. It's it, it set, but it's set apart. It's set apart. We are a holy people. 
We're called in sacred scripture, a holy people. Why? Because we're set apart. It's not that we're all pious and with, with halos on our heads. That's not, that's not the sanctity that it's talking about. It's talking about being set apart for God. Priests are holy, not because they're without sin, but because they're set apart for a purpose that's, that's of God. Uh, Anyway, I, I, did, did I kind of answer you what you were? Yeah, question? you did. And what you're really saying, which always was true, uh, Jesus was always, and Paul, St. Paul said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye re renewed by conforming your life and your mind and your soul to Jesus Christ, who suffered rejection and crucifixion, and then came the glory of the resurrection, eternal life. I think... In a way, this is the kerygma or central message of the church that the suffering, the desolation, the sin that we feel is redeemed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and therefore opens up a sacred space which is eternal, which we find already here in sanctuaries, chapels, yes. in, our yes. own so in our own souls, and it, which is not touched by time and decay but can be uh, springs up to eternal life. We do we do still partake of mortality. We do still pass away. But the early Christians often referred to it as a falling asleep that we'd be raised up in the last day. I don't know if people still believe these things anymore. But this is the promise, and this is the hope of the promise. That what you're, happens, Robert, you're absolutely right, and I go right back to what what I said before. If they don't believe. It's because they have not been taught. When we get to the point of 80% of Catholics, 80% of Catholics in the Western world have stopped practicing their religion. And of the 20% who practice their religion, uh, only 30% believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. This is, this is astounding. Well, it's not their fault. It's really the clergy's fault. It's our fault. It's, it's, mm -hmm. We have not taught people. We have not taught people. People go for years without hearing a sermon on the Eucharist. Years without hearing a sermon on purity, Robert. Years without hearing a sermon on abortion. We don't talk about any of these things. Some of the, some of the, <laughs> many of the, the churches, many of the Catholic churches have have priests who give a sermon or deacons who give a sermon on. Uh, the sky is blue and the grass is green. Okay. It's, it's just uh, of, of really nothing, but this has been going on for over 50 years. Therefore, but, we have a people who are, are ignorant of their own faith. This is the problem. Okay, Father Murr, I think we could almost summarize now something very important. You asked me to talk about this synod, watching it. I'm in Rome right now, and I'll be going now to the presentation by Bishop Snyder of his new compendium on Catholic doctrine down on the Via della Conciliazione, right in front of St. Peter's Square. But yes. what you just said about the lack of teaching suggests to me an answer to my own problem, what this synod really could have been. They could have called people together, said our people are ignorant. Our people have become sort of worldly or attracted by certain aspects of the world and computers and internet and uh, sort of tinsel promises of Yes. shallow pleasure. And we want to teach them again about Jesus Christ. We want to go back. Wouldn't that, would, Robert, wouldn't that be a magnificent, a magnificent way to begin any sort of meeting of the, of the Catholic laity, clergy, uh, uh, bishops, popes, all together. Let's, yeah. let's look at this problem and solve it and do something about it rather yeah. than looking for other things. Look, there's one thing too that you said, and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I have to comment on it. There is something intrinsically wrong, intrinsically wrong with the church when the church is in agreement with the world. This, and this is the problem. Everything that, that I see happening recently is to get the, the church, which is holy, set aside the people of God, to get the church more in agreement with the philosophy of a hedonistic world. There's something wrong. 
there is something very wrong. Rather than calling sin sin, we try to we try to 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 define it as not sin. Rather than calling wrong wrong, we define it as well not right. But there there are different. No, 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 no. There's something very wrong with this whole thing, and that's what has to be. Uh, that bull has to be taken by the horns pretty soon, yeah. very soon. Well, it's 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 overdue already. I mean, I, I am so deeply moved also by your idea. The, the apostles saw Jesus crucified. Then they met him risen. There's no explanation otherwise for why their whole lives then were oriented towards him and oriented towards preaching him and oriented towards preaching him to the Jewish people and to the ends of the earth, St. Thomas in India, Paul throughout the Mediterranean. They had something to say. They had some good news. The the futility and the frustration of human life had an outlet now into yes. eternity. Yes. And this has gone down through 2,000 years, and many saints have followed this path. But we could preach and remind people that the apostles saw him, and we are the heirs of their testimony. They have handed that faith to us, and this is where our hope lies. And uh, this is what we can do. This could be the topic of a synod. Sure. And everything that those apostles taught is what we refer to as the apostolic tradition. That's why we don't change anything of it. And we cannot change anything of it. And as they were against, went against the current of the world, we also have to swim against the current. We have to swim upstream against the current, not with it. We are not to belong to the world. We are to be set aside. We are to be a holy people, a people set aside, God's people, uh, not worldly, not worldly. Amen. Father Murr, I think we're going to have a pilgrimage to come visit you. And, I hope you uh, do. And I think people who listening can sign up, and uh, we're going to stay several days in uh, in the area where you are living, near you. You're going to give us certain meditations and we're going to be visiting some beautiful sites nearby you, and it'll be a time for spiritual renewal. And uh, I think also you have a cook who's a great cook. It'll be time for a great spiritual renewal, a good spiritual retreat. All of the sites that are around me are religious and astoundingly beautiful. And on top of all that, at least one barbecue. <laughs> all right. So we will be continuing to talk. We've had really a wonderful audience here. We appreciate you all very, very much. La, L.A. Becker, La Becker, God is with us. Thank you for your comments. Father Murr, this has been really a new period in my own life. I, I wanted to mention, we did not have any podcast before just, I'd say, less than a year ago, right? And uh, yeah, we started about that. And we're going forward now. And we usually have a few thousand views, but I just did something about the Shroud of Turin and the face of Christ also in Manapello. Yes. And how a superimposition. And we didn't, we, I did it in April, actually. We didn't put it out till the 1st of October. But each day in October, we got 100,000 views because people are fascinated by, by Christ. And we are now up. Well, Robert, well, Robert you've got to compare. You've got to compare our two faces <laughs> to, to, the, to the face I of Christ. Who's going, to, who's going to turn in tune in to, to see our two faces? But when yeah, you're talking you always, about the face of Christ, yes, you, yes. You, yeah, you always get to the heart of the matter. That's it. Cut yeah. right through. Cut right through. But I, I was given a message from this that people are not so interested in debating about certain uh, difficult questions, but matters of temporal concern, but of eternal concern about the nature of the logos of Christ, his face, seeking his face. And I'm going to try to do ever more to go to that question, because that seems to be, well, more than one million people clicked on that video, and I've never seen anything like it. I did nothing to promote it. It just went. So, uh, I just wanted to give you that news and to explain that that is my thinking now to try to go in that direction. Good. I congratulate you. That's good. So uh, good night and uh, thank you. And thanks to everyone. And uh, could you give us your blessing, Father? Absolutely. 
Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. God bless you, Robert. Till next week. Thank you. And, and remember, keep the faith. Amen. <laughs>